So, hello everyone, welcome to my talk, Keeping Shell History in Sync with Turtles and Magic, or the same shell everywhere. Today I'm going to be talking to you about Atuin, which is a project I've been working on for a couple of years now. So, first a little bit about me. My name's Elliot Huxtable. Um, I'm currently working on Atuin full-time. Previously, I was in the infrastructure team at PostHog, uh, Coinbase, and a few other companies. Um, you can find me at those two social media accounts. I prefer the elephant one to the bird one, but that'll do. And when I'm not spending far too much time programming computers and indoors, you can usually find me on a motorbike. So today we're going to be covering what a Tuin is, why I made it, and sort of how it's developed over time. Um, I gave a sort of similar talk to this maybe like 18 months ago at FOSDEM, but so much has changed since then that this is going to cover that too. I'm also going to be talking about some of the lessons that I've learned from working in open source and from developing a project which has sort of grown a lot over time. So first of all, what is a Tuin? So a few years ago, probably like a lot of you in the audience, I was working across a whole bunch of different computers. I had my work laptop, my personal laptop, I had a Raspberry Pi under the sofa somewhere, um, several different machines on VPSs. And while I was aware that Shell History is a fantastic resource, <coughs> I wasn't making the most of it. So I could search it well, but it wasn't consistent, and I couldn't trust that it always had the command that I was looking for. So a Tuin was built to solve that problem. Um, <clears throat> first of all, we started by replacing the shell history file, so like your bash history, zsh history, whatever, with a SQL-like database. It was plugged into the shell via some shell hooks. So most shells provide a way for you to sort of plug into their lifecycle and add additional commands in. Um, with the notable exception of Bash, we do support Bash, but it's via quite a few hacks because Bash has very poor plugin capabilities. Um, because this is a database and it is not a flat file, we can also record a whole bunch of additional context. Along with the commands you've ran, we can record the directory it was ran in, how long it took to run, whether it exited successfully, etc., etc. <coughs> so you can see on the screen, if I wasn't standing in the way, yeah, there's the search TUI that was built first. Um, the leftmost column there contains how long a command took to run. Uh, it's color-coded by whether or not it exited successfully. <coughs> the next column contains how long ago a command was run, and then there's the command itself. So this TUI is bound to either the up arrow or to control R, and you can customize that too. Um, so the idea is to replace the existing history that you have. It contains several different search modes. So you can see here at the bottom, we've got the global search mode enabled, and this allows users to search their history from any machine, anywhere, any directory, etc. Um, oh, I, that was the filter mode, actually, sorry. <laughs> I'll start with that. So there's the filter, the global filter mode allows you to search anywhere. Um, we also have a host filter mode, which allows you to search just the current machine, a directory filter mode for the current directory, and session for the current shell session. There's also a smart workspace filter mode, which detects when you're in a Git repository and will automatically filter your history just to that repository. There's a number of search modes too. So by default, we search via an algorithm that's kind of like FZF. It's a fuzzy search. Um, we also have a prefix search mode, a substring search mode, and a couple of others. So we have this database, it's filled with shell history, and there's a ton of data you can extract from there. Um, one of the things we have is some statistics. You can see my top 10 commands there are kind of boring. There's lots of ls and cd. Um, I also haven't adopted the new git switch stuff yet, so it's all git checkout for me. Um, Lots of people use this for optimizing their workflow, so to decide where they should put aliases, maybe what they should write a script for, um, and it's also pretty popular to share on our Discord. In addition to the stats output, we also have an inspector, which I don't have a screenshot of, but this allows you to sort of view, dig deep into one command and see how it's trended over time. So maybe it's gotten slower, maybe it tends to fail a lot more often in recent, sort of recent few weeks, and that kind of thing. We still haven't solved my problem though. So far what I've described is a nicer way of searching shell history, but not really solving the problem of multiple machines. Atuin is in two parts. There's the Atuin client, which I've described earlier. 
Then there's also the Atuin server. Atuin server is a pretty simple HTTP API. Um, it's built on top of Postgres, so there's nothing super unusual there. Um, but it is fully end-to-end -end encrypted. We don't want users uploading plain text shell history to servers. That's not normally a good idea. Um, it's also fully self-hostable. So if you don't really trust encryption, you can self-host it and keep all of your data sort of off anyone else's machine. If self-hosting isn't your gig, um, we do provide Docker images, Helm charts, and all sorts of different things so it can fit into your system. Um, there's a, an Atuin server that I host, which I've recently called Atuin Cloud because the server that I host is a bit long-winded. Um, currently, it's got about 130 million lines of shell history for just over 9,000 users. And you can see the graph from my dashboards there of how it's grown over time in the last like six months. Sync has also changed a lot over time. Um, when Atuin was first built, it was not built to scale. It was built just for me. Um, I added multi-user support just sort of for fun, really. Um, and there's actually a comment somewhere in the code, if you look around, that says this approach is really naive and needs replacing. Um, naturally, it lasted way longer than it should have done. So, <laughs> um, it was based around count. So the local client would count how many records it had. It would ask the server for the count that the server had, and it would upload and download data until the two numbers matched. This was fine, um, but there are some problems there. Anyone that's tried to do analytics with an OLTP database will have found that over time, running count on your database will get really slow. Um, this was noticeable with Atuin. After maybe about six months of users signing up, I was wondering why my latencies were so high, and the database was just slammed. Along with this inefficiency, there was also some key management headaches. So as well as a username and a password, because it's end-to-end -end encrypted, users also had an encryption key. Now, this was randomly generated. It was not touching any servers, and it was entirely up to users to manage. Users struggle with passwords, so giving them another password to deal with was a bit of a struggle. Um, so if they did screw it up, the recovery process tended to consist of delete your account and start from scratch, which didn't really end very nicely for a lot of people. In addition to the key management problems, the, encrypt the sync approach I described earlier was pretty wasteful. Um, it was kind of a brute force approach, and we ended up transferring more data than was required. All of these problems led to a whole bunch of open GitHub issues which didn't really have very nice resolutions and no one really wants to have. So, Sync v2. Sync v2 was built differently. Instead of counts, which we wanted to avoid, it had much faster queries, it was relying on database indices far more than before, and my latency charts were much nicer, which made the SRE in me very happy. The better key recovery modes meant that if someone did screw up transferring a key, there was a process that someone could follow to recover their account without too much drama. At the end of the day, if you lose all your keys, it's encrypted, we can't get your data back, but we can make sync continue to work. Perhaps the best change was the precise upload and download. So previously, we were getting this count, we were just sending data back and forth until it matched. With Sync v2, what happens is the server generates a index or a fingerprint of all the data it has. The client generates a fingerprint in the same way. The two are then compared, a diff's generated, and from that diff, we can calculate the precise sequence of steps you need to make the two states synchronize. This is much, much faster, more reliable, and generally solved all the problems we had. We had a realization while building this that we're just synchronizing encrypted text. There's not really anything really special been related to shell history here. So with Sync v2, we're also able to synchronize things like dot files, a little key value store, secrets, and there's a few other experiments going on at the moment too. Sync v2 has pretty much resolved every open issue we've had regarding Sync, um, which has been very satisfying from my end. Ooh, there's some spiders. Hello. <laughs> Let me put you down there. <laughs> So, going back to the encryption, um, a turn is fully end-to-end -end encrypted, and this has been a requirement for me from the very beginning. Um, I think I saw a solution someone else had where the database was just in plain text, and it was a trust me bro, which wasn't really the sort of thing I wanted there. Um, 
for two reasons, really. So we didn't want to ask users for more trust than we had to. Um, we've already got this binary we're asking people to install in maybe the most private part of their system. Um, asking them to send data that we don't need was not a good idea. One other concept was that my database, with its 130 million lines of shell history, if it's unencrypted, would inevitably have a ton of API keys, a ton of secrets, and so much information that while people know they shouldn't be pasting it into a terminal, they probably do. This would have made my system, no, don't go on my screen. Um, this would have made my system a bit of a target for attackers. Presently, if someone were to break into my database, all they're going to get is some hashed passwords, some encrypted blobs, and it's not going to be a whole lot of use. In terms of algorithm, we've switched from Libsodium to Pasito and Pasirk v4. Um, Libsodium is a pretty standard approach, which is why we went with it for v1. Um, there's no real reason to switch, but for v2 we went with a slightly more modern standard. If you're unfamiliar with Pasito, it's way out of scope for this, but it's kind of like a better JWT, so it's maybe worth looking at. Um, and it uses some more modern algorithms. It's also designed to be extensible, so in the future, if there is a CVE for some algorithms that we use, or maybe a any significant performance improvement, then it's easy to switch. So why Rust? Um, I've been a fan of Rust for a while, and there's several reasons why I chose to use it for a turn. Firstly, a turn runs very often. Um, it runs before and after every command in the user's shell. So it needs to be fast, it needs to be low latency, and it needs to be reliable. If we're adding maybe 50 milliseconds to every command that you run, while it might not seem like a huge number, I'm going to quote a blog that I like reading, it's going to feel like I'm putting lead in your shoes. Um, if we're throwing exceptions left, right, and center, then that's also a very quick way to get uninstalled. One other benefit of Rust is that binary distribution is very easy. It's pretty much entirely statically linked, so users don't need to install an interpreter. They don't need to install a bunch of shared libraries. You can more or less just download it and go. The final benefit, which I think is simultaneously the least and most important, is that it's fun. Um, when I first started making this project, it was in my free time, it was after work, and I'd spent all day writing Go, and I didn't want to come home and spend my evening writing the same language. Moving on to the open source section. Um, I built this just for me. It was an itch I wanted to scratch. Um, I put a little bit of effort into a README, and lately we've got the new Turtle logo, which looks nice. Um, but initially it was just a side project and scratching my own itch. Over time, the project started to grow, especially last year. You can kind of see all the inflection points there. Sorry. Um, I think this is for several reasons. So, firstly, I tried to make it immediately obvious from the README what the project is, what benefit it provides, and why you might want to install it. I tried to make it very, very easy to install the project. So, if you wanted to give it a go, it was, you know, like two minutes and you could be trying it out. Um, and also harking back to the previous slide, but I think choosing Rust was quite a good benefit because that meant we got a lot of contributors. There are tons of Rust projects that are trying to replace normal system binaries. There's LS replacements, there's CD replacements, there's shell history replacements. Um, so joining that set of tools wasn't a huge, huge leap. Um, and we also have a lot of contributors who their first time writing Rust was with our project. They wanted to give it a go, it wasn't too difficult, and I think this is all because of the language. One other thing I tried to do, um, I've never really grown a community before, so this was sort of a first time for me, but I tried to make as much space for people as I could. Um, I started with a Discord server, which I'm not a huge fan of Discord for a bunch of reasons, so I'll go into those in a bit, um, but it was very easy for people to join. It was very easy for potential contributors to ask questions to see maybe where they could join in. It was very easy for existing contributors to stay up to date and maybe come back. And it was easy for people just to ask questions. Some of the benefits I've seen from having a whole bunch of people interested in my project is supporting new systems. Um, originally, we just supported Bash, Fish, and ZSH. Um, but thanks to some really cool contributors, we now support New Shell and Zonch as well. Um, if you're unfamiliar, New Shell is basically a shell written in Rust that's kind of ignoring all of the POSIX standards and trying to do something a bit different. I've been wanting to try it for a really long time. I've never really had the sort of energy to, um, but luckily there's some contributors to, to a turn who ensure that it stays up to date there. 
Windows is also something we sort of half support. Um, I don't build binaries for it and I don't distribute it because I can't ensure it's as well tested as other platforms. However, it will build on Windows and that's due to the efforts of someone who fixes all of the times I break Windows, which is great, so thank you for that. <laughs> There's also some users running a 2-in on their phone, which is not a system I'd ever considered they'd use my software on, but that's also thanks to some patches from the community, so thank you there. Handling contributions has been a bit of a personal lesson for me. So prior to this project, my software experience was entirely professional or it was entirely inside projects no one cared about. Um, there's one sort of contribution I've always been thankful for, in my opinion, has never really changed on this, and that's bug fixes. When someone fixes a bug, I love it. It's very easy to check that the bug occurs, usually. It's very easy to check that the PR has fixed the bug, and if someone's included a regression test, then that's fantastic. Features are something that I've changed my feelings towards over time. I'm still very grateful when someone builds a new feature for a two-in. However, in the early days, I was just excited someone cared. I usually merge a feature pretty quickly with a few little suggestions, but I, I didn't think too much about long-term vision or whether it's something I want to maintain and whether there are any potential issues it could bring. Over time, I've been burned a couple times by a feature which I felt 50-50 on, but I included anyway, and the maintenance cost of it was very high. Normally, people don't stick around. This is completely fine, it's not a job, we're not paying them, they turn up when they want to and they go when they want to. However, the code that they've committed stays until someone fixes it, replaces it or removes it. So over time I've learned that unless a feature is something that I think fits into the long term vision, unless it's something that I think me or some other committers are willing to maintain and fix long term, then I'm going to have to say no, which I don't really like very much. Support has been a long lesson too. So any project which gets traction is going to get a ton of GitHub issues. And I've spent a bunch of time trying to figure out how we can reduce that burden. First of all is to make search easy. Um, I don't actually just mean the GitHub issue search here. That's maybe where you might first think people would go. It's not the best. Um, people also turn to Google, and SEO tools are actually really useful for optimizing open source support. Um, I normally track what people are searching before they get to my docs, if possible. If my docs don't contain the answer to that search query, then it's a nice signal of I should probably write those pages. I've also introduced a forum in the last six months. Um, some of my issues with Discord are that Discord is very bad to search. The sort of You get people asking the same questions over and over again. It's also not indexed, so unless someone's joined the server, they're not going to find the answer to what they're looking for. With a forum, we can direct people towards there to ask for help. It can be indexed properly. It's not going to pivot into a refounded on AI company that maybe I don't trust the long-term ability of. Um, and there's a bunch of other benefits too. I generally try and think that the best issue is one that isn't opened. Um, a friend of mine suggested we build a sub-command that tries to fix issues before someone asks for help. So we now have a two-in doctor. And it's currently really simple. It basically just dumps a bunch of information about someone's system that they can paste into an issue. Uh, this is usually you know, what versions of things they're running, what configuration they have enabled, all of the questions that would be asked in a back and forth. What it will also do is it will try and debug problems. Um, there are some file systems that we did have maybe not ideal performance with, and if it detects that someone's using one of those, we can point them to an issue with some workarounds, and that reduces the questions we get asked to. One of the other things I've had to come to terms with is that I can't actually help everyone. Um, for a while, I'd spend so much time trying to answer every single person's GitHub issues, emails for a little while too, and it got to the point where it just wasn't sustainable. Um, I try and focus my efforts where they're most valued, I suppose, and where maybe other people will feel the issue too, and maybe where it's, it's easier to reproduce the problem. So what about the future? Um, we're spending a lot of time working on this, and there's sort of three areas I'm thinking about right now. 
first is a UI. Um, it may not be as immediately useful as a terminal interface. However, I found that we have a ton of data that we record that can be really useful to explore. And no matter how much I try, I can't make a terminal interface that's as intuitive and nice to explore data with than something graphical. Um, I've spent a while trying, and it's, it's, it's just not quite the same. One other thing I'd like to do is I'd like to make terminal customization more accessible to people that maybe don't spend their weekends reading man pages and looking through their dot files and that kind of thing. And I think by providing a graphical interface, we can do that too. Something else I'm working on is synchronizing dot files. This was mentioned a little bit earlier too, um, but I think we're synchronizing little pieces of text, which is pretty much what configuration is. And right now, a two-in can sync aliases and environment variables as well. Um, the aliases are immediately useful in shell history too. Um, so that's something that's being worked on for the future. And I'm also looking at exploring the idea of runbooks. Um, it was pointed out to me that most runbooks are just a subset of shell history uh, with some documentation. So exploring how the two can be integrated to make them easier to share, easier to run, easier to test is, is something I'm very interested in. And this is the part where I'm a bit embarrassed because I forgot that there's no Q&A on stage. Um, so this will be something where I'll have to catch up with you all afterwards. Um, but if you're interested in the project, you can find it at uin.sh. If you're interested in anything, things I've been working on, you can find my blog at ellie.whatthefuck. Um, sorry. And, <laughs> and thank you to everybody who's contributed. I've tried to put their face there, and I might have missed some people too. But yeah. That's everything. Thank you.